for centuries, the old kingdom of Solon, or the island of Tapropan, as the ancient Greeks called it, was an important port and trading post. Today, Sri Lanka is known principally for the beauty and great diversity of its landscapes. Despite a 30-year-long internal conflict, the Sri Lankans remain alive to the wisdom of Buddhism and understand the importance of preserving their island's biodiversity. Off the tourist's beaten track lies Sri Lanka's central highlands, an increasingly popular destination for foreign travelers. Many eco-lodges have been built to meet this growing demand. On the edge of one of the country's largest national parks stands the eco-lodge owned by Dane Lars Sorensen. If the gods are favorable and there is no traffic, it's a three-hour drive along dirt tracks. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Wimmer. Yes. You are Mr. Lass. Yes. Glad to meet you. Yes. Nice to so, see you here in you? the jungle. Yes. That's Welcome. Okay. Today is a crucial day for Lars. He's welcoming Vimal, a rather special visitor, who may hold the key to Lars's financial future. He'll be deciding whether or not to send Lars the customers of the travel agency he represents. An almost impossible marriage between ecology and economics. The radical nature of Lars's project hurts him financially. To limit man's impact on the environment, he refuses to accommodate more than two couples in his eco-lodge. And that means few financial rewards. Okay, Mr. Wimmer. Yes. Please come inside Thank the you. tree hut. Sure, that's nice. You get nice views. Uh, when I began developing ecotourism here, I made this place the Im immediate area around uh, the lodge um, to jungle. So what type of uh, activities do you propose to your uh, clients here? Yeah. The main thing, if we think about the uh, experience here, living as close as possible uh, to nature, living with the birds, uh, with the wild animals, living with natural materials, that is um, the vision, uh, if we think in terms of experience. University studies in Buddhism brought Lars to Sri Lanka. That was in 1999, in Kandy to be precise. Buddhism and ecology. Lars has put a lot of time and effort into his eco-lodge and has invested in the island, its inhabitants and its eco-tourism plans. Sri Lanka's geographic center may lie in its mountains and tea plantations but this is also its spiritual and historic heart. It was in Kandy, a holy city and the former capital, that the independent kings resisted the British. However, Ceylon's former capital became a colony of the British crown in the early 19th century. Kandy, or the big city, as the Sri Lankans call it, is the country's second largest city after Colombo, the financial capital. Kandy a spiritual stage for Lars. Every day, a small train leaves Kandy, winding its way through the hills and tea plantations to Nurelia, the capital of the highlands. Traveling in its compartments are tea plantation workers and tourists from all over the world. We decided to go by train, as it's the best way to see the scenery and meet the local people. It's also extremely cheap. The travelling conditions are far better than we had expected. And from our seats, 
we can see this panorama. Lanka is the world's leading exporter of tea. The tea industry employs some 700,000 people. Half of these are tea pickers, a job reserved exclusively for Tamil women. As for the environmental impact of this industry, it's a picture of contrasts. For although tea growing hardly requires any fertilizer, it has led to the destruction of 250,000 hectares of forest. The women toil at high altitude, often in the cold and the wet, and always on steep slopes. They work in small groups, and in this season, swarms of starving leeches cling to the tea bush's leaves. These bushes would grow up to 20 meters tall if they weren't disturbed by the tea pickers. The tea is really excellent. It's fragrant. Here, in Sri Lanka, everyone drinks tea. The tea I'm drinking, we find it very pleasant. We drink several cups a day. We tea pickers, our hands are to thank for this tea. I know that somewhere in the world, people are drinking tea. I have picked the tea I drink. Adam's Peak, in the heart of the mountains, in the tea-growing area. Thousands of visitors, pilgrims or hikers come here to get closer to heaven and the gods. For over a thousand years, Adam's Peak has been a sacred mountain for followers of three of the world's major religions. According to the Sri Lankans, Adam, Shiva, or Buddha left a giant footprint on the top of the last paradise on Earth. This paradise can be reached by climbing several thousand steps. Mere mortals are drawn by the beauty of the place and the sense of the divine. At last Sorensen's eco-lodge, Vimal continues his tour. After the premises, a walk in the forest. Lars is going to see if any elephants came in the night. The human-elephant conflict. Every year in Sri Lanka, 100 people are trampled to death and crops are destroyed. To protect themselves, the remote villages post lookouts in the trees. How are you, Lars? Fine, thanks. Did the elephants come? No, nope, I didn't see any. The night wasn't too long. 
this area, people are watching the fields. You get the human elephant conflict here. Um, life is very difficult. In Sri Lanka, totally, there are about 2,500 elephants. They need wild areas outside the parks. They can't live only inside the parks. Um, the national parks can sustain maybe only 50% of the total uh, elephant uh, population. So it's very important to try to preserve wild uh, jungle areas uh, like this. A sacred animal and the national symbol of Sri Lanka, the elephant has always lived alongside farmers. It is also a domesticated animal. 20 years ago, they numbered 700. Today, there are barely 200 left. And an expensive animal, costing almost as much as a truck and taking several years to train. The Mahouts fear their livelihood will soon disappear. We were very much in demand for transporting stone blocks. This still represents the bulk of our work. Or, if there is a car accident, we use our elephants to remove the vehicles. When I was young, few people went to school. My big brother took care of the elephants, and I often accompanied him. I've always loved them. As I was always around them, I became fascinated by the Mahouts, and I've become one of them. It's really hard work. You have to take good care of the elephant. If you don't look after it, you can't get to work well. Young people are not interested in working with elephants, and it is almost impossible to find an apprentice these days. Everyone used to dream of becoming a mahout. Times have changed. There are fewer and fewer elephants. The domesticated elephants are dying one after the other. Those living in the jungle are wild, and we are not allowed to capture them. The government has to do something, or there will be no elephants left, not even for the Perahara. The 30 years civil war between the government and the Tamil Tiger rebels has claimed thousands of lives and left many animals maimed. This female was hit by an anti-personnel bomb. She was taken in a few days ago by the Pinawala Elephant Orphanage near Kandy. This orphanage was set up by the state in the 1970s to take care of injured or orphaned elephants. At present, almost 100 are being cared for. The calves often fall into the farmer's ditches. As a result, they become isolated from the herd. Other elephants get shot, die in accidents, or they're injured, attacked by wild animals. Their calves become orphans. It is the young elephants, alone and sometimes injured, who come here to Pinawala. It is our job to treat them and make their lives as pleasant as possible.
twice a day, the group goes down to the river for a bath. It's refreshing exercise, but also anti-stress therapy. This has beneficial effects on reproduction. 37 elephant calves have been born in Pinawala since it was set up. The Pinawala Elephant Orphanage is financed by fee-paying visitors, donors, and its elephant fostering scheme. Flowers, plants, trees. The vegetation is lush and abundant. Traditional medicine makes use of many of Sri Lanka's plants. There are lots of medicinal plants. Look. This one, for example, is used to treat the eyes. It's a very powerful medicine. This is Madrathala. It's crushed and used as a mosquito repellent. This plant is edible, but it is also a medicine used to treat depigmentation. The study of nature and the use of wild plants lie at the heart of one of the world's most ancient systems of health care, Ayurvedic medicine. Roughly translated, Ayurveda means science of life. In Sri Lanka, there are over 6,000 practitioners of Ayurveda. Their diagnosis is based on three criteria, somewhat strange to the Western mind. The patient's internal balance, dietary habits, and astrological chart. Wild plants and flowers are made into extracts or perfumed oils for soothing and sometimes unusual massages. One unusual massage involves the gentle pouring of warm oil over the forehead. Known as Shirodara, this treatment is said to relieve migraines and stress. Many lakes dot the landscape. They are ideal spots to discover and observe local wildlife. Here at the lake, as you see, this is uh, a fantastic uh, and magic spot. Yes. Um, we, see, we see wildlife here in the dry season mainly. Uh, right now you can see birds, you can see uh, Brahmin kite, pelicans, uh, white-bellied seagull. It's a very good bird place. Almost none of these lakes are natural. Made over 1,000 years ago for and by the sovereigns of the time, they constituted a sign of power and wealth. Nowadays, in the dry season, they irrigate the rice paddies and fields and refresh the Sri Lankans. As he himself says, Jayasana is the boatman of the sunken forest. Aged 51, this fisherman knows the secrets of Kandalama Lake. 
the tips of these submerged trees are a reminder that this area was once forest land. I'm always delighted to show people my lake. Our ancestors built it with their bare hands till they had blisters on their fingers. Since then, thousands of farmers have enjoyed its benefits to irrigate their rice paddies and to feed themselves. Wild animals also enjoy its benefits. Birds, cattle. I also live thanks to this lake. I can work as a fisherman and feed my children. Many families in my village exploit the lake's resources. Very occasionally, we get travellers, tourists. They love discovering this spot. They come to see the beautiful scenery and to admire the wildlife. It makes them happy. I show them my environment. It means I can supplement my income and improve my life. Let me take you to a special place, a secret place few people know. It's a wonderful, magical spot. the ruins of a temple that has lain forgotten since the 7th century. This building attests to Sri Lanka's spiritual history. 500 bonds lived here. They withdrew to this forest hermitage to meditate. These days, no one comes here apart from Jayasana and the few foreigners he occasionally brings. Lars Sorensen's ecological approach and Vimal's own experience at the lodge have convinced him. He intends to bring new visitors to Lars's eco-lodge. But Lars must make a financial decision to increase the lodge's capacity. This is the whole point. Uh, we don't want to become um, a mainstream uh, conventional uh, hotel here. I want to develop this place make a few more accommodation units, but it has to be kept with the original uh, atmosphere, um, keep the same feeling I had when I came here the first day. So it has to be a very discreet uh, and natural setup here. Otherwise we cannot uh, coexist uh, with the wildlife. Probably there is no other way to conserve the last uh, wilderness areas of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a nature tourism paradise. Sri Lanka has everything needed to meet this growing foreign demand. But it must act wisely if it is to preserve its ecological resources and respect the environment. Maybe the gods will see to it.